Hey, it's Tony Bruski, and this is our Week in Review. Over the weekend, taking a look back at some of the most compelling conversations and stories that we've covered for you of the last week. Brand new episodes back Monday morning, bright and early, 5 a.m. here on the podcast. This is a case that I think we're going to be following for quite some time. Corey Richens is the children's book author who uh, wrote the book about grief for children, uh, how to handle grief, how to deal with grief. And we're going to play back the interview on uh, this uh, episode of Murder in the Morning uh, from the local television station where they do the little, you know, morning pieces of, oh, here's a local author and uh, we're going to do a little dissecting uh, into that, uh, me and Stacy Cole with you. Uh, you've been doing sure. some diving into this over the weekend, too, haven't you? Oh, my gosh. I It just the story gets more bizarre the more I dive into it. And I'm I'm addicted to it. I am so here for all of this. And I'm so sad that somebody has died. Yeah. But this is a, a convoluted story of. Uh, a wealthy family, um, repeated attempts to kill her husband. There might be an affair on the side. I mean, there's just, this has everything of like a lifetime movie. It really does. I mean, it, it just, there, there's so much of this where it's just this extreme narcissistic behavior that people engage in and they're all around us everywhere and they look normal and you think everything's good, but then you dive into some of this and you discover, oh my gosh, Look at the actual glue that was holding some of this relationship together uh, from the inside out. And then you realize just what kind of hell and torture uh, some people in their relationships are in. And he even had signs. He was telling his friends, his his family about some of these warning signs. And we'll get to that uh, in just a little bit. First, let's go to uh, the video here, the audio you guys are obviously going to hear on the podcast. This is of uh, Corey Richens uh, on a local news show uh, uh, promoting her book uh, about grief. And we'll, uh, we'll pause as we go through this to, uh, to comment. Uh, also going to be having uh, on the uh, program here on the Hidden Killers podcast some uh, behavioral experts in the coming days. So uh, be sure to press subscribe for that because we're going to be diving even deeper into this uh, with uh, with some of those folks. Let's uh, let's start it from here. Parent, a sibling or a friend talking about loss with kids can be a tricky subject. Joining us now is author of Are You With Me? Corey Richens to share her three C's to helping kids cope with grief. And Corey, I want to start with your story. What happened in your personal life? So my husband passed away unexpectedly last year. So it's March 4th was a one year anniversary for us. And um, he was 39. It completely took us all by shock. Um, and we have three little boys, 10, nine and six. And, um, you know, we kind of my kids and I kind of wrote this book on the different emotions and grieving processes that we've experienced last year and you know hoping that it can kind of help other kids you know um deal with this and kind of you know find happiness some some way or another and to make sense and process i'm yes. sure and i'm yeah. sure you felt that going mm -hmm. through and trying to explain it and articulate it for you and your boys yes exactly exactly and so i've done you know I'm new to all of this, so kind of doing all, you know, research and reading books and things to try and understand, you know, not only how to grieve as a widow, as a, as a wife, but also, you know, with my kids, how to help them, how to help them understand what just happened. And um, what I have kind of found is, as I mentioned, it's kind of the three C's is how I has visualize it. And it's, you know, um, connection, continuity and care. And it's, you know, making sure connection is the one major one and making sure that their spirit is always alive in your home, you know, and memories are always brought up and doing things that your loved ones love to do, whether it's riding bikes or their favorite dinner. Or breathe, <laughs> breathe yeah. air, have, have oxygen and be able to look around and interact with the children. Interesting so far, you know, everybody grieves differently. This this interview took place roughly a year after the death took place. So even if it wasn't a murder, you could look at her and go, you know, she's been through a lot already. You know, she's maybe not there. She's not here to 
you know, be crying on the couch of the TV people right. uh, at that moment in time. But there does seem to be a bit of a disconnect uh, in terms of what she's speaking about. And what's interesting about individuals like this is sometimes they go to great lengths to almost overcompensate for things in their life. When something like this happens, she killed her husband, allegedly. Um, how do we make this look? What would what be the ultimate thing to make it look like you didn't kill your husband? Well, probably not killing your husband. But how about you write a children's book about grief and helping them through it? And you want to help other kids deal with it, too, because this was so horrible. It's a learned behavior. And, and she can watch other people in how they react to things. And she can emulate it. And they can sometimes do it very well. But at the end of the day, on the inside, she's just following kind of directions on what she's learned on how people grieve and is able to demonstrate it, but it's not coming from a place of authenticity, if you will. What is so disturbing to me is the the part that I keep forgetting is if she did this, if she killed her husband, like, like it's proposed that she did, the pain that she has caused her children yeah. is immense and I, I'm curious to know, um, the kids are 10, 9, and 6 at the time of this interview. How are they doing? Do they know that mom is, you know, under investigation for allegedly killing their dad? What what are they thinking at this time? That's what I want to know. Well, and number one, how do you, you shield your kid from that? And should you shield your kid from that? Um I mean, it, number one, a 10 year old's going to be able to figure it out if they have access to any sort of device. Um, right. If they're going to school, um, they're going to hear things. Well, um, and everybody in the community is going to be talking about yeah. this. This is huge. And I mean, and it just it, it's just astounding to me to it's one thing to want to get out of your marriage and you leave the marriage, you get a divorce. It's another to kill your spouse and then focus your entire existence on I'm going to address the grief that I've created allegedly um, for my kids. I well, mean, that adds just another layer to this whole thing. It also puts them into a place of purpose and to be the hero and to be the one, the yeah. saver, the one that's coming in and saving the day. That's another big piece of the complex when you're talking about a personality disorder like that. They want to be the savior. You see it quite a bit uh, in narcissistic mothers. Um, you see yeah. them uh, causing issues uh, quite often with the children and their relationships. And then you see them being the savior or the fixer of the issues uh, as well. Uh, so it, it's an interesting dynamic and it's one I'm, I'm sure she has learned how to play. Let's continue on with the audio. And just constantly, you know, talking about them and... And Corey, do you mention at dinner, here's dad, or dad would like this meal, or dad yes. would, yeah. let's bring dad on a bike ride. Yeah, exactly. And it's, you know, explaining to my kids just because he's not present here with us physically, that doesn't mean he, his presence isn't here with us and he's doing these things with us. And he's, you know, here for birthdays and he's here for Christmas and, you know, yeah. and it's just comforting to them to know that you know they're not living this life alone like mm -hmm. dad is still here it's just in a different way it's like this is what she oh. said to tell herself to because I'm, I'm imagining there may have been some i don't know if, if you're a remotely sane human being which clearly she probably is not um you would hope that maybe there's been a moment or two of regret if she allegedly did this where she sees the the pain that her children have gone through and maybe yeah. maybe crack the narcissistic shell a little bit of oh maybe this wasn't the best idea maybe i should have just done something else maybe i shouldn't have done this you know i yeah. whoops can't but, can't take that back can't take it no back but, but if you can convince everybody that they're still there and yeah dad's still here with us no he's not he's fucking dead he's not there anymore his memory can live on with y'all especially your kids, but no, yeah. he's not there. And if you did this, that's a pretty sick way of looking at it. And it, it, she's very self-assured when she's talking about that. Like, see, he's still here. It's all good. It's okay. Let's continue. Yeah, he, it's well, fine. Up your book you know, he's just here in a different, in a different realm. It's just a different um, yeah. reality in which he's here. And I, I find it really interesting 
um, that she had mentioned that, oh, yes, dad would like this meal. Well, she tried to kill him with food at one point. Mm -hmm. So to me, that was that a part of reality coming out? I, I, let's continue on pages. I saw as a little boy, it looks like he's standing in a hallway at school and he's mm-hmm. saying, are you still here? Yes. Yeah. And it's, you know, and that was like the first day of school and, you know, all the nerves that kids face on the first day of school with new, you know, and just hoping, you know, dad, like walk with me, like help me get through today. Like give me the strength to do that. Um, and it has found, you know, a, it's been a lot of peace for my kids to, you know, to really remember that in the back of their head, that they're never alone, you know, so. So you actually wrote this book with your children. I did. Mm -hmm. And it's only been a year. How did you process and say you go from processing death to I need to write a book and help others? You know, I just watched the struggle that my kids were going through. And I actually, you know, I went on Amazon and Barnes and Noble and trying to find something that we could use to cope at nights. Nights are the hardest, it seems like, for everybody when, you know, dealing with anything. But I just wanted some story to read to my kids at night. And I just could not find anything. I couldn't find anything that really, you know, suited them or helped them find comfort and peace. And so, you know, I was like, let's just write one. And so, you know, I took things that my kids have said to me this last year and we kind of articulated it and put it into a story and, you know, just have hopes that it will help other kids. Grief is not linear. And this Mm -hmm. sounds like it's a touchstone when you need it to come back to for you and your boys. So the first one you had mentioned was connection of the three C's, keeping Mm -hmm. the person's spirit alive. The second continuity. Yes. And that's, you know, just making sure you're trying to stay, you know, as, as much as you can on routine and keep telling them the same story. Keep telling yourself the same story over and over. So, So yes, I guess content and continuity is is important um routine i think would probably be a little bit more of a correct word to use there um than continuity um but yeah routine is important when you have something dramatic happen and your life changes uh to help the kids uh to stay grounded um but it's just when you look at it through this lens it's like okay you know whether it's really distorted you know sports drop you know sports or pick up and drop off from school or community activities just you know, trying to stay in a routine as much as possible. And then the last C is care. Yes. What does that mean? So, you know, on top of just loving your kids and hugging them and kissing them and, you know, extra cuddles and everything, I think it's important that I've learned to really affirm, you know, their feelings. When they're mad or they're sad, you know, it's just that affirmation of, I understand, like, that you are upset, you know, because of this. Like, let's talk about it. You know, and so I think really it's not, you know, it's the emotional and physical touch of it, but really letting your kids understand that you know why they're feeling the way that they are feeling and it's okay and let's deal with it and talk about it. There's a promotion right now. Get a free copy of the book April 30th and May 1st through Amazon Kindle. You are an amazing woman and (laughs) mom and we thank you for being vulnerable and sharing this and touching the lives of others. Thank you. I really appreciate being here. Thank thank you, Corey. I'm sure you do. Oh, she touched the lives, didn't she? Oh, she certainly touched the lives. Allegedly. You know, watching that, it wasn't as, I guess, telling as I thought it would be. I waited to watch it till we were on the air. I've seen little snippets of it here and there, but that was the entire interview. Uh, Yeah. You know, there's just, there's a disconnect. It's kind of like what I talked about earlier. She's giving instructions on how to be human uh, is really what she's doing. And if, if you are not very good at being human, you need those instructions. So it's... It's interesting. It's interesting that that she's coming to it from that perspective because I don't think a lot of people who carry out crimes like this, if she did do this crime of murder, there there's something missing and you don't have that. There's something that allowed her to do that. Keep in mind when we look at the actual case here, there's a lot of uh, bizarre timing going on and a lot of it uh, is surrounded by a, a, a fixer-upper, if you will, uh, where... She wanted to buy a property. He was not too keen on buying uh, this property at all. He did not want to fund it. He didn't think it was a good idea because it's a 22,000 square foot fixer upper (laughs) that that may be a little much. Wanted to pay two million for it. Um, And she 
you know, thought, oh, we're going to flip this and we're going to make money. Well, he wasn't for it. Guess what? He died the day before uh, she went to go close on this house. The timing is so bizarre. And yeah. further in the story, after she closed on the house, after he died, she had a party, a raucous party mm -hmm. of where she was celebrating. Yeah. He's dead. And that's the last thing anybody would do. I, I, yeah. I would think. I mean, even if you're in an unhappy marriage, which it sounds like it was, because he had been talking uh, to his family. He's even told his sister, if anything happens to me, look into her. He changed. Uh, she went in and tried to change the beneficiary and his life insurance to her after he had changed it. And he changed it back without her knowing. So she was kind of surprised by the fact that she didn't get a big windfall at the end of the day. Um, mm -hmm. But it, it, it just shows that it was, it was not a happy place to be. If you're sitting there as a parent and you're changing your, your life insurance policy to someone other than your spouse and you're actively married to them, that's a marriage that's not going to last much longer. Uh, it, it, it's, yeah, it's, it's creepy to be into that sort of a situation or to feel like your spouse may kill you. Um, I've been in that situation before. And believe me, it's not fun. He told his family that what he was doing was staying there for the kids because he thought it was safer. It was better. He was he saw, said he thought it was probably naive, but he did not see any other way out of it. And I know women do this all the time, but yeah. I'll tell you what, men do it a lot too. We just don't talk about it as much. We don't get the Lifetime movies about us when this shit goes down. But this shit goes and it's, down. It's not very manly to no. say that you are fearing for your life. It's, no. Our society doesn't lend itself to say that it's okay for a man to fear for his life within the confines of a marriage. No. You know, there's women's shelters and things like that, rightfully so, because technically in our world, it seems as though men have a better financial footing than some women. Mm -hmm. But it should still be acceptable to say, you know, I'm in an abusive relationship here and I'm a man. It yeah. should be okay to say that. There's not a lot of that out there. Um, no. and, and I can guarantee there are countless men that are sitting in relationships that are there because they're there for the well-being of the kids. Uh, and they don't really see necessarily another way out uh, at that moment in time. And that's a scary, scary place to be. You think, you well, I'll get through this. I'll... I'll, uh, you know, wade through it. And I did for a long time until it came like close to being on Dateline. Uh, <laughs> and then I'm like, I'm out. Tony. I'm out. We're not doing, we're not. Nope. And I mean, I know it was never a uh, physically abusive or anything like that. But uh, at the end, it got so scary that I had to say, no, I'm, I am not going to expose my daughter to this more. And uh, I'm not either. And it's, it's a weird place to be. And, and to walk away from that, uh, we we're talking about partying. I didn't want to fucking party. I mean, I was, no. you know, it, it's like, yes, it, it felt good that the, the situation had, you know, kind of resolved itself. We were in a, a safer place or setting, you, you think. Um, but it was one of those things where I don't want to fucking party. I mean, it was, it was a failure of something that was, you know, you, you want the best for it, but sometimes it doesn't work. Uh, and even if there is, you know, it gets dangerous and it's scary. You're still not like, yay. No, you're grieving. You're grieving and I loss of a idea, a loss of a goal, a loss of, you know, a spouse, you know, and you don't, I mean, most people don't want negative things for other people. I don't, uh, even people no. that do wrong, but it's not a, Hey, let's have a fucking blowout <laughs> you know, when, when the, the relationship ends and my significant other did not die, but move different ways. And I still didn't want to have a party, you know, at all. It's still a loss. It is. You, you lost is. The, the dream that you had of, of how your life was going to be. So yeah. the fact that you didn't want to have a party after that, this lady allegedly kills her husband and still throws the party. I, yeah. The body is, you know, probably not even processed at the funeral home at this point. Yeah. It and, just it, it screams of narcissism and and just you know, maybe maybe that's her way of dealing with grief. She wanted to be around her friends. But I wouldn't think it would be a celebration. It would be, you know, let's just surround her with love and support. That's not what it was. This this sounds like someone who, you know, had the veil over everyone's eyes on what reality was in her relationship. And 
probably got a lot of what she wanted, uh, no matter how ridiculous it may be for quite a time from her husband. And eventually he said, no, he said, no, it's not a great idea for us to buy the unfinished 22,000 square foot home and fix it up. That may not end well for us. It may, it may cost us more. And when she was told no, then hmm, guess what? Yeah. Narcissists don't yeah. do well with that word. And I would, I would guess that this person probably is far more than a narcissist. But it's a scary, scary story. We're going to continue to follow this in great detail as we learn more about it. I know there's allegations that maybe she was having an affair as well. Uh, I think we're going to learn a lot more about uh, everything that's gone on uh, in the coming weeks and months as we continue to cover this one for you here. Uh, if you ever want to weigh in on this case or any other ones, we'd love to hear from you. You can weigh in, and then we may uh, use you on the air, 888-554-5537. 888-5KILLER is the phone number. We would absolutely love to hear your feedback. Murder in the morning. Again, 888-554-5537. There's more to come on this in the coming days. For Stacey, I'm Tony. Stay with us. From the Hit Killers Podcast.